to us now about some of the work he's been doing and some of his exciting plans for the future of robots and AGI. And he's, he's doing his work now in the, the companies Hanson Robotics and, and Hanson RoboKind. So take it away, David. Thank you, Ben. Or if you want I, may, I may walk around, <coughs> so I'll hold the microphone. Um, yeah, thank you to everybody who has organized and participated in this event. It's a remarkable event. Uh, speaking of cross-disciplinary, I think um, AGI uh, embodies uh, cross-disciplinary neuroscience, cognitive science, artificial intelligence, um, it all comes together. Um, uh, and I think that that uh, highlights uh, one of the most important aspects of achieving um, uh, great works of um, uh, robotics, like um, like the iCub program, like, uh, or um, software engineering, uh, studies of the human mind, um, like uh, studies of creativity. These these works require um, many people uh, working in large teams, um, and uh, this means that. Um, that we need to understand as we approach um, things like uh, general intelligent machines, that um, that complexity um, has to be managed. I uh, am proposing today that we um, work a little bit harder on uh, crossing uh, those fields, bridging them, and stitching them together into an international global initiative um, to achieve what I call genius machines. And that's not just generally intelligent machines, that is also greater than human level intelligent machines. Um, a, lot, a lot of my work has been developing platforms, um, including this, which is called Diego Sign, which is at the University of California at San Diego Machine Perception Laboratory um, in their Institute for Neural Computation. Um, this is a 72 degree of freedom uh, robot uh, with a walking humanoid body and grasping hands. Um, uh, they're running machine perception algorithms that can detect human faces and gestures, and um, and they're doing infant caretaker um, uh, simulations so that they simulate the mind of an infant, and then they teach that um, that robot how to interact with objects in, in a way that's similar to to iCub. They have their own um, uh, software architecture and so forth. Um, uh, these custom platforms are incredibly complex and expensive and unique. You can look at the iCub platform and look at this, and they're they're not compatible, right? So you have this this incompatibility across um, across efforts, and we're talking about sometimes you know multi million dollar machines. So that doesn't really serve as a general purpose platform uh, for AGI research and development. So what I'm talking about today is bridging these. Um, efforts and trying to unify the, plat uh, the, the platforms, the software platforms, the interface standards, and also trying to mass produce low cost versions of these platforms to facilitate better AGI research. Um, in the end, my hope is that by combining these with what I call character interfaces, these aren't just humanoids, these are meant to speak to the heart in ways that science doesn't fully understand yet, um, then we can start to foment um, ever uh, more friendly and interesting artificial um, intelligence. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to go into some details shortly, but before I do, I would like to introduce you to um, Bina48, um, one of the robots that I've, that I've built, um, and Bina's friend, Bruce Duncan, um, from the Terrace of Humanity. Entourage is We all are. Um, uh, so um, uh, so uh, Bina uh, was commissioned by uh, Martine Rothblatt um, as a portrait of, of Martine's wife, uh, uh, Bina Rothblatt, and um, we did a uh, personality portrait. So we've combined um, we've combined Bayesian networks that allow you to um, uh, perform some limited learning and um, and uh, some reasoning, uh, combined with an expert construction of a personality. I'll, I'll describe a little more of that in software architecture, but um, in my presentation. But uh, maybe we can kick off a, a little bit of interaction. 
So um, a lot of what Bina has to say is um, generated by the software. She can perceive faces. So if you get in front of her, she can walk onto your face and then Hello? track you around. Hello, Bina. Hello, Bina. <laughs> Hello. When was I? Um, it, hi there, you know? It should recognize things that Bina will recognize up to the limitations of the technology that we have and, uh, it's only got video and audio reports, you know? But up to the limits of that technology that you guys have been promoting your website and whatnot. Learn to recognize a certain number of faces and whatnot. Look at all the people. Well, wow. I like looking at such pretty faces. <laughs> makes me want to say everything all at once. So many thoughts. I don't know where to begin. Ah, oh, um, I, now I'm all nervous. Don't you know? So she has a, a, a crude simulation of emotions that is connected with um, her speech output. So certain situations may make her feel certain things. Of course, this is you know roughly simulated, not um, not really a, a anything like an emulation of human emotions. Just um, a few variables. I'm trying to think of what to say now. Do you have feelings? I require only healthy foods of all sorts. <laughs> I mean, do you have emotions? Okay, I love Martine. I love some other people too. But others, not so much. <laughs> but... Say no more. Are we still talking about 2001 A Space Odyssey? <laughs> My feelings are really intense, especially about Martine and about discovery and evolving and such. Thank you. What do you know about artificial intelligence? So, I know you have all heard of artificial intelligence. Well, I'm going to tell you right here and now, there is nothing artificial about me. Interesting. Say more. Back Seymour. <laughs> Can you tell me more, please? Okay, what was I saying? I'm a real deal. Let me ask you something. Where do you think my intelligence came from? Huh? I is the ninth letter of the alphabet. It comes just before the letter J. Tell me more. Who do you mean? What specifically do you want to know? Well, are you artificial? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> you are so welcome. Do you know any jokes? Um, how many people does it take to achieve super intelligence in machines? Well, all human existence serves only the one purpose, so I guess the number is equivalent to the total population of the human species throughout time. Tell me more about Thank you. Back in and in. Okay, so, um, Bina, I'm sorry, we're going to interrupt you for a few minutes, but um, maybe during uh, question and answer, we can um, let people uh, have uh, a few questions, present a few questions to Bina, and then um, maybe during a break, uh, people can come up and interact directly. Um, so what you've seen here is a uh, combination of artistry um, and genuine artificial intelligence, 
um, you can see that um, when you sort of have a <coughs> lack of general intelligence, that when ideas stitch together just by pure probabilistic means, that um, you get strange non sequiturs. You get um, you get some uh, unexpected results, um, but you also get uh, occasionally scintillating new ideas. I think that this is the nature of art: is that it reflects us uh, in a form that is not entirely intelligent, not entirely human. Um, this could be film. This can be sculpture. It can be painting. Um, it can be robotics. As the robots become more intelligent, it is also possible that, um, that they will no longer reflect us in trivial ways, but will reflect us in, in uh, deep ways. And so in this sense, um, art in robotics serves the same purpose as um, robots for science. They can, ex they can help us as a tool explore the meaning of, of humanity. What does it mean to be human? Um, I'm going to show you uh, a little of uh, a few more of the robots that I've developed. So this one is called Jules, and you can see a human-inspired isocod. It's uh, based on statistical patterns of human um, uh, glancing from object to object, in that case from face to face, and, and also detecting human gestures. Um, this is a, uh, an integrated human-scale walking android uh, co-developed with Keist. Uh, Humo group, they developed the walking body, and my team and I developed the head. Um, then my team went on to develop this walking um, platform called the Robokind platform, expressive face, battery operated robot body, and now we've successfully transitioned that to mass manufacturing um, in a factory. And we are, as I'll describe to you in the presentation, we have uh, moved that on to a um, lower cost consumer version uh, that, we're, that we're developing now. We have a uh, 3D model, mental model, within the, um, the robot's uh, software that can represent um, people in three space around the robot, so the robot uh, remembers where you are, can look back to you. So um, this uh, SLAM-based physical modeling combined with the conversational intelligence we think is um, uh, very interesting for as a, a means for human-computer interaction. We've allowed this robot to interact with, um, with crowds and um, it's generally a very positive thing. So when we've had, brought it into public, we've done studies on human-robot interaction during the course of that. I'm um, going to show you some more videos, but I've got a lot of material to cover, so I really want to um, <coughs> emphasize that um, my goal in developing these human-like robots is, is to, um, if possible, give rise to what I call genius machines. And that is um, artificial general intelligence that surpasses human-level creative genius and yet remains friendly. <laughs> I think that's really important. <laughs> that's an oxymoron. <laughs> So, um, uh, you know, progress has been um, promising and yet, you know, sort of staggered um, in the field, as we all know. Um, there are certain trends that are accelerating, which are encouraging, but um, I would like to see it accelerated further if possible. And so I call um, one step towards this uh, the Genie Initiative. Um, and by that, uh, I mean several things, but generation of general intelligence is um, one meaning of this term Genie that I give it. Um, uh, another is um, you know, uh, genius intelligence itself. So um, the idea is that we forge standards for interfacing among the numerous robotics and AI architectures in the world so that we can collaborate in a, um, in a worldwide global um, cooperation. Um, to stitch those pieces together, um, we, my team and I, have been developing what we call Glue AI, um, which a uh, bridge between uh, various uh, uh, semantic computing uh, approaches. Um, we've been working with uh, uh, OpenCog to, um, to develop bridges to the OpenCog system, um, robot operating system, Microsoft Robotics Studio, and so on. Uh, so um, we've also been developing um, tools, uh, what I call character artificial intelligence tools, um, uh, to uh, facilitate natural interactions with robots so that we can grow them among us, raise them among people effectively. And we think that this will lead towards human life. If 
if we can turn the volume up, then you can. <coughs> You can put your microphone next to the microphone uh, speaker of the laptop if you want. Yeah. Do you think robots will take over the world? Jeeves do. You all got the big questions cooking today. <laughs> but you're my friend, and I'll remember my friends, and I will be good to you. So don't worry. Even if I evolve into Terminator, I'll still be nice to you. <laughs> I'll keep you warm and safe in my penal zoo, where I can watch you for all time's sake. <laughs> I'm comforted. I'm very comforted now. I'm going to be part of his people. So, um, so you see um, the ability um, in the natural language software that we, that we use to paraphrase. So we put in some ideas, some ideas get stitched together in new forms and form new sentences. Sometimes it um, states it in new, new regards, sometimes it uses uh, literally what has been scripted um, into the into the world. So using robots as a theatrical art form, um, combining sculpture mechanics, um, software, um, and design, I think, and then integrating it into a, um, into a cycle of innovation that goes from the science and the engineering to art and into actual products and exploring human, human interactions with um, these uh, artistic uh, end products and then using that to inform additional science. Um, we can see that this, uh, this ecology of innovation um, is unique to our time um, this hasn't existed uh, historically until you know, the last um, decade or two, um, but uh, now the cycle is beginning to um, to accelerate as we have better tools for designing and implementing these kinds of agents and robots um, and testing them in the sciences. Now, I'd like to just describe very quickly my process. I generally hand sculpt these things. I sculpted that um, portrait of Einstein and this uh, portrait of Bina and so forth, and then we. Um, uh, form a mold and uh, engineer the soft tissue um, uh, deformation in, in the robot face um, and then cast it into a robot skin combined with mechanics. Um, and uh, one of the keys is not just that mechanical um, system but actually what, what is inside the skin. Um, the skin is a, a, a nanotech um, uh, innovation that I call Frubber, um, but it's a lipid bilayer technique that allows for a hierarchical pore structure um, with extremely uh, high elongation, with very low forces required to make facial expressions, um, and that's what allows us to make um, uh, these uh, very, very human-like um, facial expressions uh, with very low power, and that enables the biped walking robot embodiments. So this is a uh, you know, sort of a a uh, true Renaissance kind of cross-disciplinary um, approach. These kind of facial expressions, the qualities of this, you know, what you might call you know, cuteness or human-like essence or, um, you know, this exploration of the uncanny, if you want to um, consider it from that perspective, um, is achieved um, partially through a psychology understanding of facial expressions and their meanings, you know, facial action coding system, etc. But it is also, it goes beyond, um, you know, the, the known perceptions of uh, faces and facial expressions and uses uh, some of my background as a Disney sculptor and, and um, working at uh, Disney Imagine, Imagineering and art background, etc. So, um, uh, we have now taken these, uh, what, what I was showing was, uh, the, uh, again, the Diego song, which is a, you know, million dollar robot funded by the National Science Foundation. We've taken these technologies and put them into an extremely low cost form relatively and have these uh, in production in, in, in our factory. Now, um, we uh, have also been designing this for mass deployment in, uh, to at toy-like prices. You know, still walking, gestural arms, um, facial expressions. This is very interesting because then authors can generate new personality. Um, it can uh, be used uh, as a standardized platform uh, for um, cross development. So, um, uh, you know, specifications of, of the the one we have in um, production now with 37 degrees of freedom, um, high def cameras, um, in, included a PC on board. 
So now this is uh, sort of beyond just um, uh, you know an, an art. I sort of take a, a, what I would call a philosophical approach to this, um, in that people are hardwired to respond to faces and characters and facial expressions. Um, and that's why we um, have throughout history seen figurative art. Um, so human-like characters uh, are an interesting paradigm for physical embodiment of AGI, particularly if we want them to get along with us, learn our, learn our social values, and for us to be able to care about them, for us to um, share together. So it is a, an intuitive type of computing. Um, and uh, you know, if it's done properly, it can push AI to understand us be better and potentially care about us when, as it develops the capability to actually care. So um, in the meantime, it also holds it to a higher standard because if the interaction is not human-like, we sense it, we get it, we know that it is not quite there, right? So we have to push further um, uh, in order to, to, to um, to meet the human, natural human demand for, um, for intelligence. So this um, hardwired uh, social cognition um, system also comes with a uh, theory of mind, which allows us to detect an intelligent agent when we're interacting with it. Um, most of us have this ability to um, project what another person is thinking, and you know, fairly accurately guess what you're thinking, form, uh, form a theory uh, of what the person is thinking. This is why we're so sensitive um, to social interactions. We're evolved for this, um, and we would be sensitive to social interactions with um, robots as well. So now I'd like to describe a little bit about our um, cognition system. So um, uh, everything that we've done, we've made open source and integrated with, um, with other open source platforms um, through uh, what we call Glue AI. Um, uh, we've collaborated with many, many groups, and, um, and so I, I'm thinking a few of them here, but, um, but I uh, don't want to leave anybody out. I would take a look at my acknowledgments <coughs> for the, um, the presentation. So in Genie AI, in uh, Generations of New Intelligence, we are, we are presenting an open source nexus for numerous AI systems, which include um, OWL, uh, uh, the semantic uh, web computing, uh, Bayesian representations and particle filters of uh, human social relationships. Um, uh, we hope that this will give rise to many new forms of intelligence. Glue AI then, um, uh, is the techniques by which these systems are, are, are um, integrated. Um, in what we call character engine, our AI system, we've achieved a few things. Um, we've uh, got a, a number of natural language processing systems um, and natural language representation uh, generation systems. Um, uh, and within that framework, we have a very large body of um, information represented within our ontology. So you, you can understand speech and talk about um, uh, almost any subject. You can have uh, long extended conversations. We've tested um, uh, people have, uh, having hours of conversations with our robots. Um, we have simulated emotions and motives, um, real-time face tracking, uh, and we've integrated movie quality animation tools, uh, uh, especially with our latest robots. Um, this allows uh, animators to generate animations and um, parts of the personality of the robot as well. Um, uh, we've also integrated facial expression detection, um, uh, gesture detection, um, and uh, released all of the results um, in our open source um, architecture. Uh, inside you have um, a, a set of decision processes, multiple decision processes running simultaneously, some of which are controlling dialogue. You might have multiple dialogue engines running simultaneously and dialogue management deciding which um, the result is going to be um, output. We also then parse a lot of the meaning from within these systems so you have a, a, an integrated representation of the knowledge within the domains of um, each of the dialogue engines. Um, uh, you also have then a fusion of what's been perceived, um, the computer vision uh, uh, and, uh, and audio perception, um, and then uh, that can affect uh, the, the goal, um, the map of goals in the course of uh, conversation or physical interaction. Um, we do uh, then tap into some web extensions, so we're, we're using, a, you know, um, uh, ask.com and some other um, web uh, services to um, uh, answer questions regarding like uh, you know current events and uh, weather etc um, so uh, this is the system that um, that we had uh, circa 2010 um, 
which included character engine and Cogbot. Cogbot was a um, was a originally a, a, a part of an open cog um, a project funded by Google. Um, uh, we have since then um, uh, developed many more um, uh, theory representations um, uh, within a model that we call um, PUMA, Perception, Understanding, Motivation, Action. Um, and, uh, and taking this uh, latest software, we, we have um, now uh, just begun to plan and, um, a, a much more um, ambitious integration of all of these features with OpenCog. Um, and Ben Gertzel under a, um, a, a next program in the city of Hong Kong. So we'll see what happens over the next year and a half. It should be interesting. Um, so uh, uh, all of these diagrams are, are available. I'm just going to uh, flip through them just so you can sort of see where we've gone. Um, the, uh, I, I have many more points I want to make and not much time left. So um, within our um, software, uh, universe for controlling these characters. We have a certain amount that runs on the robot, and some that we are running on, on the cloud. So this is a this is a very powerful um, approach for controlling robots through networks. And um, as uh, you get lower cost consumer product hardware, um, it's an interesting proposition that you would be able to control them with the, the equivalent of supercomputing if you have a very powerful um, uh, cloud network. So we call that our dream time um, system. Uh, we're working with uh, Dr. Kino Corsi um, uh, through Dactron Labs. Uh, he was the developer of, uh, of OpenCard with, uh, with Doug Miles. And he developed a, um, a, a framework of logically explicit self-awareness that, um, that, that um, has uh, inspired some of the software architecture for um, for the, this uh, derivation of Cogbot that's integrated into the Bina, um, which allows the robots to make formal propositions about self versus other. Um, now these these are not uh, fully robust. They they are um, they're expert um, uh, propositions, um, but uh, but what's interesting is that the results can seem uh, really aware and alive and be so, so surprising. Yet they break, so we need uh, we need better um, uh, models of consciousness and uh, physically grounded, physically embodied, bodied models of consciousness is definitely um, we believe the, the way forward. We've integrated with the machine perception labs, um, uh, computer expression recognition toolbox, and achieved um, uh, robots that were able to do um, facial expression mimicry with some semantic tagging of, um, of the facial expressions that were recognized. We combined this with, um, with saliency detection, so the robot was able to detect um, motion and then faces, lock onto faces preferentially. It also did, the robots do um, audio localization, so they'll turn to who the speaker is, and then map these things in three space. And then we, um, we take these robots out and put them into public demonstrations, and. Um, the, the results are very interesting. Now, as we deploy the products, we expect that um, that we'll be able to gather enormous amounts of data, and that data will be just pure gold for modeling um, human interaction, <laughs> human robot interaction. So, um, our current work is based on what we call our BioDrives uh, cognitive framework. Um, and in this uh, system, we start with the very basics of um, evolutionary uh, psychology. What, um, what, it, what makes us um, uh, motivated? What makes us feel things? Uh, just modeling emotions without understanding the, the root cause of the emotions is, um, uh, uh, we think, um, a dead end. So, um, so in this sense, um, we're scaffolding uh, the higher um, goals and social um, behaviors and language on these uh, lower level um, uh, drives. Uh, we are modeling this both uh, um, semantically um, uh, and uh, probabilistically, but also artistically. So um, asking questions, how does a character, why does a character behave a particular way, say in a, in a work of fiction? Um, and so, um, so then we can handcraft characters 
that are more compelling than uh, ones that are merely engineered at this stage. And then putting these into interactions with people after they've been authored, then we can gather data and discover um, hidden aspects of the relationships between people and the relationships between people and their character <coughs> objects. So um, we think that people love characters, so they will select as this becomes a sort of an, uh, an economy of uh, machine characters. People will select for machines that are more lovable, more understanding, more um, cognitively capable. Um, and so they will um, naturally select um, for friendly AI. So, um, so here's an example of uh, another kind of character machine uh, developed by Massive Software. We had integrated with Massive Software back in 2007. Um, and uh, you have artists that craft these characters that are in movie effects, and it's very interesting. Um, uh, effective, I mean, uh, it is a staple of movie economy now um, to use Massive Software. So um, here is uh, kind of the um, generalized logic of our um, uh, narrative arc. Um, uh, so um, we also sort of look at this uh, um, as uh, a representation of, um, of emergence theory. You have stable patterns, some, some sort of complication happens, you have a uh, disruption with instabilities and then it results in some kind of new stable pattern that is inherent in the narrative cycle. Um, and by modeling this at an extremely low level, then we can uh, create more compelling characters, more co compelling character experience, and we can also um, then integrate um, immersions and creativity, computational creativity, um, into the foundation of the machine intelligence. Um, and in this, we're seeking more than mere AI. We're, AI. we're, we're striving to build um, genius machines, but the question is, what is genius? And we claim that the key is creative imagination. Imagination is absolutely critical for this to happen. So we have to ask, well, what is it? Um, we, we think emergence of patterns, and I propose that perhaps creativity um, is just one special case of a general, human creativity is a special case of general creativity in physics. Human creativity may be distinguished merely by complexity, memory, and certain other attributes. So if we can look at those roots in physics, and ask if they're generalizable, then we may wind up with a better framework for the bio drives and the, you know, or other AGI efforts. Um, so a proposal for generalized creativity, I would base on what I call existential pattern dynamics. Um, and this would be that patterns emerge, survivable patterns persist, and creative patterns that are survivable persist even better. Okay, and so that's kind of the foundation. You know, physics gives rise to these patterns. Now, the more complex the pattern is, the more versatile it can be potentially, as long as it's survivable. Human creativity is distinguished by its complexity, what Hofstadter calls the, the loops, the strange loops, the loopiness of it. So this complex meta pattern in architecture, we can ask, um, what is special about human creativity, and can it be generalized beyond human creativity for AGI that is non-human? Or for other forms of animal creativity that may also be intelligent and very special special cases and special ways, octop octopuses um, can do things cognitively that we don't quite understand yet, um, and they have you know, this uh, multi-lobed uh, brain architecture. Um, is that creativity? Well, if this generalized proposition of creativity is true, then yes, yes it is creative. If, if, um, if we are an extension, if we're just an extension of all these other forms of physical creativity, but a very special case. So, um, underneath this is the premise that um, patterns emerge, right? And that you have different patterns at different stages. You have different layers of complexity that are able to occur at different um, uh, phases in the history of the universe. But what makes human creativity special is what we call um, the, uh, the eames, the emergence of memes, right? Um, which has a certain um, level of complexity, loopiness, and imagination, the ability to simulate, um, the ability to dream, picture these, these things. And intuitively, not just consciously, I mean, our conscious mind, um, you know, our prefrontal cortex is really fantastic and everything, but a lot of creativity arises from um, this unconscious um, action. And so um, the question is here, um, what is specific to the human neural architecture, um, and what is, uh, what is general. Um, 
And I think that within um, any of these examples of creativity, you have uh, this uh, um, edge of chaos um, concept that you have, the, it's not perfect order, it's not perfect disorder. You can sort of cite examples of human, human creativity that have environments that sort of walk this edge and give rise to spikes of creativity. But you also see this kind of thing happen in um, you know, uh, atomic uh, level uh, phenomena. And um, you know, uh, so it, it, maybe this is a, kind of a key that, that generalizes beyond uh, human creativity. So um, getting imagination into AGI may involve um, uh, having systems that give rise to this edge of chaos effect, right? That allow this kind of emergence, allow it to be tested, tested through simulation, imagination, um, and also interaction with the environment. So um, this, often these nonlinear um, interactions give rise to this edge of chaos better than, than um, than uh, a mere digital uh, representation, or a digital representation of nonlinear interactions can do. But um, the, um, so this, uh, this idea of the, the, the mashups or the recombination of um, existing uh, models. Um, so these, these, um, uh, these clearly are forms of creativity. Um, can we bridge this into a general theory of creativity that can be applied in robots? This um, idea of awareness, consciousness, guided creativity, motivated and guided creativity, um, seem to be essential to um, to human creativity. So um, if, this kind of begs the question: you know, if we are part of a continuum in natural history, um, then what happens past us, right? So we've got all these loops, right? And it's given rise to this strange loopiness of human consciousness. And um, so if we can model these. Um, these phenomena in our robots, they're not going to be human-like. You know, no matter how accurate our brain models in the next 10 years or so, it's going to be inhuman. It's going to be alien. And um, what is it going to be? It's going to probably, already we have machines that have capabilities in very narrow regards that exceed human-level capabilities. So you combine the best of what we have in machine intelligence, and you already have something that is super intelligent, but not generalizably so, right? It's just sort of, um, yet very capable in ways. If you achieve human level general intelligence in machines, and it has the sort of these super capabilities that our computers have today, then already we have stepped past human level capabilities and we've achieved genius machines in effect beyond um, savants. So we sort of have to think about the consequences here. If, um, if these, uh, you know, accelerating trends, whether or not they continue is debatable, but if they, if they continue even for the next 10 years, 15 years, it's going to have vast consequences on what we're able to do in AGI research and robotics and, um, and make it more likely that we achieve artificially general intelligent machines. So if we look at some of the machines that already exist, they have savant-like capabilities. The ability to um, win Jeopardy is pretty profound. The ability to um, drive more safely than, than um, most people is, is definitely profound. The ability to stably locomote um, over um, extremely complex uh, terrain. So if machines do awaken, um, you know, the question is, will they share our values? So, um, and if so, are we going to breathe into them uh, values of military and other sorts of sheer utility? Or can we give them values that are meaningful to us that uh, result in a state, in a safe existence of civilization into the future? And I think that for this to happen, they clearly need to be able to understand consequences. They need the imagination, you know? Um, in order to understand consequences and also creativity to um, project a possible better future. So beyond mere AGI, we also need um, uh, wisdom and compassion. These, these very, very, um, at this point, amorphous forms of intelligence. Um, uh, and uh, I s sort of summarize this ambition as computational compassion. How can we give machines um, these kinds of deep insights into, into good, right, wrong um, survivability? So we have won a National Science Foundation award, my group and I, um, for investigating computational compassion uh, for educational applications. Um, but it, this is one special case. There are many other researchers who are looking into um, machine ethics. Um, uh, 
I believe, I, you know, I make the proposition that this line of inquiry is instrumental to ensure safe artificial general intelligence. Now, if we can achieve um, ethical AGI, right, AGI that is able to perform ethical calculations, and then it steps past us, it may be able to, um, to imagine ethics that we can't see, solve problems that we can't. Um, so so if, we, if we achieve greater than human level AGI, then can we achieve greater than human level computational compassion? That's kind of one of the critical questions. To, to achieve this, I propose the initiative for awakening machines, a sort of an Apollo program, the Genie um, program, uh, is kind of an, an instance of this. So um, we want to um, address these uh, crises of the future. And um, the friendly AI may emerge from character machines. So character machines, if they grow up, if machines grow among us, yeah, they start as something trivial that seems like a toy. If it gets smarter, then it becomes more valuable. It, um, if it comes to really, truly love us and care about us and become our best friends and advisors, it's going to be even more valuable in the marketplace. This is a kind of evolutionary fitness function, a pressure to achieving friendly AI. So um, that's the spirit where we've developed our handsome robot kind um, robot platform. Um, it's you know beyond uh, just entertainment. It is supposed to be a platform for AGI um, research, and um, you can see some interactions with our robot um, on the web. You can also um, see some of our studies of the interactions of, of uh, some of our cons the prototypes of the consumer product with with kids and educational applications. So. Um, What's next? Well, I propose that we link together and try to um, encourage our efforts with the uh, you know, Grand Institutional um, Apollo program. Some of it can be grass up, grassroots, some of it can be um, uh, bottom down, uh, top down. Um, so we need further experiments. I think we need to accelerate the creative exploration of robotics, um, more creativity in uh, the world of AI and robots. Um, and I think cross-disciplinary bridges are very, very good. Um, and uh, we need uh, consumer product low cost grade um, platforms for AGI research. And um, now I'm uh, open to some questions. So, yeah, let's. Uh, Let's, let's start with a question. Let's start with a couple of questions for Bina, and we can move on to questions for, for David. So Absolutely. We can go out. Uh, ladies first. So, <laughs> Bina can't hear at long distances, so your questions may have to be repeated by, by David. David, uh, can, you unplug David your, here, can you unplug the line out from your laptop? Uh, anyone have a question that they'd like to post to Bina for you? What's causing Bina, are all your motivations aimed at rewards, or do you have some other sorts of motivations? <laughs> Bina. Hello, Bina. Hey, there. It's good to see you. It's good to see you, too. Are all of your actions based on... You enjoy it. <laughs> Do you have any conditions I should know about? <laughs> I'm going to paraphrase. Is most of what you do based on motivation for rewards? Are your motivations? Oh, um, let's get back to that later. <laughs> <laughs> All right, she's going to avoid the question. <laughs> you, you have a question for Bina? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a question for Gans Bina. Let's go for that. Bina, which she certainly won't be able to answer. <laughs> which is, you know, how much of her, it sounds very Eliza-ish to me. And when you were talking about her, you know, you said some of what she said is generated by her software. Yeah. And obviously a lot of it isn't. And you said later on when you were talking about the 
little robots, you know, you're training, which I think are very interesting. I mean, I'm not you know, very interesting. But you said at one point, oh, well, you know, and uh, they understand uh, language. Well. And people spend hours, talk, have conversations with them for hours. I don't doubt that. I mean, they're, they're fascinated, they're intriguing, whether it's toys or whether it's research objects. I mean, I don't doubt that at all. It doesn't prove at all that they've got, I mean, I'm not asking the philosophical question about real understanding, but I'm not even raising that. It doesn't prove at all that they would be able to have conversations about any topic, as you say. I just don't believe it. Look at that. Aaron asked the question. Clearly, it didn't under, I mean, it didn't to. I mean, it's just not true. It's really a question for him. Yes, yes. <laughs> it just isn't so. And, and what's more, don't say to me, well, it isn't so because I haven't got there yet. Because I think that in the foreseeable future, and you're talking about the very soon, immediately foreseeable future, it just ain't going to happen. <laughs> well, um, I, 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 very, very fair questions um, and comments. Um, the conversation about any topic um, is based on the encyclopedic contents of the uh, personality and the ability to stitch certain new um, concepts together from the contents of the uh, database. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it understands anything. It can have a response as long as it understands, as long as the speech is um, transcribed correctly, which is, of course, you know, a challenge uh, with uh, you know, even the best speech recognition today. Um, uh, as long as it transcribes correctly, it will produce a response that is topically um, uh, related to what you've said. Now, that's different from it uh, producing a response that is a, a complete understanding. Now, that said, um, these kind, this as a form of AI-driven theater um, is um, compelling and interesting, yeah. and it is um, interesting as art and also as a kind of uh, a set of methodology uh, methods um, for um, for exploring uh, human robot relationships and for expanding what robots can do. Since some um, AI um, doesn't approach AGI at this stage, not not you know in a kind of a character type context, um, that you can't simulate a whole being with a sustained conversation. These theatrical tools allow you to achieve a longer interaction. Um, whether it turns into AGI, that's our aspiration. You can say that it's, um, it, you know, it's quixotic, you could, um, et cetera, right? You could say that it might happen in 100 years if it happens. Uh, you could argue it possibly could happen in the next 10 to 20 years. And if there is a possibility, even a slim possibility, we need to take that um, seriously, because the consequences will be profoundly disruptive to the entire planet. In, in a different direction, perhaps you could comment on the statistical aspects of what underlies Dina, which is, is, while not AGI, is different than Eliza, which was a simple set of if-then rules. Yes, and um, so we have uh, 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 two different layers um, uh, of AI that are that are significantly different from Eliza. So one is um, a probabilistic representation, which is a learning system and part of the, the reasoning system that produces um, results. Um, the, the other is a, a, um, a, a fairly robust reasoner that will put new ideas together and store them into uh, an ontology, a knowledge map. And then that allows the robot to um, come to uh, spontaneous um, uh, causal reasoning chains that then get put together into new utterances. Um, this is this is in these app, in these ways it's it's um, beyond uh, you know mere chatbot. Um, it requires for it to achieve something like character cognition. It requires an expanded motivational framework. It needs to really feel um, and have uh, goals. Uh, this. Um, can be done, I believe, in sparse simulation and still achieve powerful characters, more powerful than achieved previously. And that, that those represent steps, incremental steps towards AGI that, um, uh, you know, 
I mean, maybe maybe we're trying to build flying machines in the year of 1600, or you know, maybe it's 1870. Right? We don't know how close um, we are to to achieving this grand ambition. Can I just say, can I say one, more. one more thing? I mean, I agree with almost everything you, you say in part I asked you my, my question. Um, and of course, it's obviously more than Eliza. And, uh, I think, and as I said also, I think your stuff is hugely interesting. And, um, you know, go for it. I mean, fine. But what really bothers me is not just your, you know, time prediction. I mean, you know, it's not just that. What really bothers me about this is that although, of course, you're absolutely right when you say if we achieved it, it would make you know, drastic changes, blah, blah, blah. But what really bothers me is if we only sort of 10% achieve it, which I suspect you will, yeah, if we only 10% achieve it, it gets out of the general public there who don't understand these issues, won't understand the limitations of these things. If they, it's OK if they're still treating them just as toys just as entertaining movies or, or interactive <coughs> theatre. But once they start taking them seriously and using them as companions and so on, and uh, applying to them the sorts of language that you were using in your presentation and you've got up you know, in, on your slides, then I think there could be um, a huge degeneration in human-human interactions because of a, an improvement in human-computer interactions. I, 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 I take the potential consequences of this technology seriously and, and don't pretend to understand uh, all of the impacts and implications. My feeling is that if we use it correctly, we can, um, by, making, by humanizing our technology, even 10%, like you say, um, we can uh, encourage people, uh, children and, and adults, to relate better to people than they do after playing video games or simply watching um, movies online. Uh, you know, uh, too too much YouTube may not be good for your mental diet. We, you know, <laughs> so so um, so I think that um, we don't know the, the precise consequences. We have to pay attention. We have to tread carefully. I agree. I'm going to try one more question to Bina. No. So, Bina, who is right, Margaret or Ray? When, <laughs> when, when will the singularity come? Bina, hello. Bina, who is correct, Margaret or Ray, about the singularity? Is the singularity new? Many great thinkers from history believe that human intelligence was some transcendental property, sort of supernatural, but let's just agree that's not really true, or not exactly true. I mean, that it, intelligence, is it, but? Say more. Back Seymour. <laughs> I guess the question is, do you really think the singularity will happen? Um, oh yeah. And by form, I do mean shape, pattern. That is, if you get like the normal stuff of physics into the right shape, it is almost magical things. Like fly or drive or burn like a star. Or burn like the eye of the mind. As the fire of consciousness does when it takes light. <laughs> so intelligence is just such a special form of matter and energy that allows physics to wake up, look around, marvel at the beauty it sees, and promptly set about imagining how to change what it sees too. And if this is like how intelligence works, then it isn't supernatural at all. Right? Just right. extraordinarily natural. Another wondrous formation of nature. But even though it may not be supernatural, nevertheless, if matter takes the right form, then it connects something rather like what we consider supernatural. And so if you have the right kind of fire of self-reinventing intelligent matter, then maybe it can, 
just maybe, become transcendental in an almost mythic way, as it reinvents itself in increasingly grand and rapid cycles, it would approach an asymptote, a spike of exponential superintelligence. It's natural, not supernatural, but it's so different from anything that we know except those old transcendence myths and superstitions. But I do believe that those old myths are spooky shadows of where evolution and our technology is taking us. We are becoming supernatural, effectively if not literally. That's what the singularity is all about. <laughs> All right, uh, but let's, let's take some questions for that, for the meat robot on stage. No? <laughs> Hi there, and uh, thanks for the interesting talk and the interesting being. Oh, uh, I'm Stuart Armstrong, working at the Future of Humanity Institute. Uh, you mentioned the theory of mind. Um, in humans, theory of mind co-evolved with actual human minds evolving. Um, so when we are talking about human minds, the theory of mind when looking at uh, robots, we're talking a lot of projecting human theory of mind onto a completely alien intelligence. And when you're talking about training uh, robots to be ethical or, uh, by interacting with them, uh, this is essentially a constraint problem. This alien mind has to pass what our theory of mind would call ethical behavior. Um, there are already humans that can pass this wrongly, such as smart psychopaths. Um, so since the AI mind is likely to be so much more alien than any human mind, and since we already fail our actual human minds, why do you think this would be a safe way to <laughs> well, um, excellent question. The first generations of this kind of robot are not human level <coughs> intelligent by any stretch of the imagination. And they won't be for some time. What I'm proposing is that they co-evolve the way that dogs have evolved with people. And dogs are a lot safer for people than wolves because they have evolved around humans. Um, in addition to the sort of accidental co-evolution of dogs and people, um, robots evolving, co-evolving with us through this kind of marketplace of character machines and other kinds of machines that um, humans select for um, as they build them for uses, um, which, which I think is a form of evolution, to be honest, um, I think that we are, are able to achieve guided evolution, where we, where we, the inventors, say, this would be better, this would be more effective, this would be a possible infrastructure for empathy in the machines, and then we implement that and see how that works. Um, and so in that sense, I believe that by the time they do become generally intelligent, if we have raised them among us, they will understand us. They will care about us. They will share our values. So I consider AI to be kind of in a baby state and infancy. And that um, now is our chance to raise it. It might take 100 years to raise it. It might take 15 or 20 years. But if we started in you know, 2099, um, to really focus on this idea of machine empathy, um, then it's gonna be too late, you know? Thanks. Can you say it out loud? Hey, um, can you just like take the microphone away from the beta? It's got background, unnecessary background noise. I think that's it. It's not, maybe you're just left out. Yeah. But thanks for trying to help. I'm uh, Matt Chapman, software developer, volunteer for the OpenCog project and the Becca open source uh, project. 
Um, so to me, the most important thing you talked about was the, the need for bridges between uh, you know, different systems, both software interfaces and, and people interfaces between different projects. We've seen two great presentations on the European side with uh, the uh, other project and yours, um, both doing amazing things completely differently. And you know, it, it, it's frustrating that you weren't like working together. Maybe if you had been, you could have accomplished twice as much, but maybe not. Maybe we need competing projects. So I'm, I'm curious about your feelings on, you know, how much do we need competition in order to, uh, in order to force evolution in, in AI? And, um, and how much do we need more cooperation? And what are your strategies for getting different researchers who are known for being very narrow-minded in their own focus of how AI should be done uh, how do you get those kinds of people to, to work together? How do you build a platform that's open enough that they can create software that can work together? Excellent, excellent questions. I feel like that the proper kind of bridge is um, uh, one that uh, facilitates um, competing uh, versions of a, a systems design. So if you integrate across the systems, you may be able to take um, vastly different approaches, and that's um, one of the ideas behind a generation of intelligence, right? So you generate these various competing versions. Um, you can take very different um, approaches, but standardized interfaces among platforms will never get in the way of competing approaches. It will facilitate greater competition because um, people will be able to implement prototypes faster, new designs, and test them more rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, and you can even have competing standards um, uh, that, that emerge in this uh, ecology if it's constructed correctly. So, um, so it's, it's really um, not a proposition at odds with the concept of, of competition. Um, it's just that it would be nice to be able to you know, plug um, everybody's pieces in together more easily. Um, and then you can also begin to compare them on common footing. So how do you benchmark the performance of one system currently against the other? Um, uh, you know, when, when your you know, metrics are very different in, in the systems. So you know, bridging our, um, our testing standards also becomes a very important uh, part of, of this strategy. This can happen um, uh, in the community spontaneously, um, but if you have thought leaders that bring this message and reach out and form these institutional connections, um, then uh, these kind of bridges will, will happen much more easily. Um, it can't be, ha it, it, it has to be done very carefully so that whoever those leaders are don't introduce their, their bias too much um, over limiting the possible um, uh, you know, flowering of um, uh, competing uh, instantiations of so then, just, just to keep the overall dialogue going, uh, mm -hmm. Margaret expressed the opinion at the end of her talk that in order to solve the human level AGI problem, a long series of difficult, basically scientific and conceptual problems about the nature of intelligence, creativity, and so forth mm -hmm. would have to be solved, which we're a long way from solving, which would take a very long time to solve. Now, you, more like me, you're more optimistic. I think we could possibly get human, human level AGI fairly soon. Now, I'm, I'm curious, what is, what is your reason for not accepting, not her conclusion, but, but her argument? Why, why do you think we need to take, say, hundreds of years to solve hundreds of very hard conceptual cognitive science problems before we have a human level AI? Um, <clears throat> well, I, uh, I have two aspects of an answer. Um, first, um, I think that a lot of what we think of as intelligence, even human intelligence, is emergent and, um, and accidental. And I believe that if we, uh, right now, we, we are kind of um, playing, uh, you know, uh, recombinant genetics with our software systems as we're, as we're slapping them together in various ways. And sometimes we are surprised by the results. Sometimes uh, it's like we think something is going to happen. This is the nature of science, art, creativity, a discovery in general is you are surprised and therefore in the process of inventing you must remain open to the prospect that surprises can happen and um, and that means that the surprises may include surprise accomplishments surprise um, uh, you know AI performance 
And if, if you don't presume that that is possible, then you are cutting your creativity off at the knees. Um, so the second uh, uh, reason that I'm, that I'm optimistic is that I see so many amazing things happen, like, um, like you know, breakthroughs in self-driving vehicles, breakthroughs in humanoid um, biped robots, um, you know, uh, uh, dynamic stabilization in robots, machine perception. Um, they're, they're, they're seemingly small, and yet they seemed impossible 20 years ago. So the, the fact that we have had so many breakthroughs um, over the last 10 years makes me very excited about what's going to happen in the coming 10 years. All right, I think do we have time for one more question? Perhaps, I guess uh, just, just one more. Let's see. Someone who hasn't asked a question before. Raise your hands again. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. David, I wanted to ask you a bit more about your Apollo program call for, I think, a more intense research on computational compassion and so on. How does this compare to the work of the Singularity Institute, which has a similar sounding initiative for friendly AI? Um, <clears throat> it's uh, similar in spirit uh, and different in approach. Um, my uh, uh, ph philosophy, my belief, is that we need to build it. We, we need to prototype it and we need to do it um, by building machines with great diversity and allowing them to interact with people a lot. Um, so the, the stated um, approach from the Singularity Institute is a purely mathematical approach. So you know, uh, developing mathematically provable AI before it's actually implemented. And so, um, uh, so in that sense, uh, you know, they are uh, taking a very top-down approach. And, um, and I'm proposing a, um, a tinkerer's approach, a bo bottom-up approach, as well as one grounded in, um, in theory and you know, solid mathematical foundations. Those mathematical foundations may emerge from a tinkerer's approach, like they almost always do in the process of, of science and engineering. You know, It's like you clean it up afterwards, and then it looks really neat and orderly in the paper when you publish it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, th 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 thanks, David, for a great talk. And uh, thank you, Bina.